Uh, all right. Well, hi, everyone. We are back with another Prog Report podcast and a very special one, as you can see from our special guests below, Mr. Mike Portnoy and John Petrucci. Uh, Mike, of course, is a, a regular by now on the uh, Prog Report. Uh, but thanks for being back on, Mike. And uh, Jeff Bailey, as always. Uh, He's probably been on more times than me. Actually. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, and uh, well, to have you guys together on this is really uh, is really cool. And and uh, probably when we started this podcast uh, many many years ago, um, never would have anticipated that we'd have the two of you together on something like this. So it's really special and very cool. And uh, and of course, uh, we are here to talk not only about our. Uh, special topic that we have for the podcast, but about the new liquid tension experiment, uh, album that, uh, is coming out on March 26, LTE three with, uh, Jordan Rudis in 2011 also. And, um, I should give some insight. I had the amazing privilege to, uh, interview you guys and the full band, um, back when you guys were recording in the studio and some of that footage may or may not be out by the time we air this podcast. So, uh, that was amazing. Um, but you know, we want to give a little bit of background into the album. Um, so just a quick sort of recap on, on how it got together. Who, st who started it? Let's start there. You want to go, John? Uh, yeah, you could but, take, I, I was but, a holdout. <laughs> yeah, by the way, that's, that's John Petrucci. Hey, <laughs> he's below me. I don't, I don't know where, where, where he's being viewed in the square, but I'm, in my I'm Brady bunch. Cam oh yeah. Okay. It's like I the Brady think he'll bunch. be, I, well, if it's my camera that's recording he'll be to your, uh, left. Or that way, the other way, <laughs> that left. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah, Mike, uh, you could take it. Um, well, you know, it, it's hard to really pinpoint who initiated it because we all have been wanting to do it for, for years. So I think it was on all of our minds. Uh, uh, I, I think the simple answer is, um, I guess, you know, over the past couple of years, uh, I've been spending a lot of time with John and got to spend some time with Jordan as well. So the relationships were really starting to, you know, feel comfortable and good. And, 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 and you know, I, I uh, played on John's solo album and uh, played with Jordan on Cruise to the Edge. So it really was at this point, just kind of a matter of timing. Um, and I think we all wanted to do it. And once the pandemic hit, it gave us a window of opportunity because none of us were touring and we were all home. And um, I mean, that's the, that's the short answer. You know, I think we all wanted to do it. I think Jordan and I kind of probably went to John and, uh, you know, kind of had to nudge him and just see when, when he'd be available and, you know, interested because he was dealing with his solo album. Yeah. Uh, I remember you, you made a really, really funny comment. You were like, we were texting or something and you, I said something, I just have to finish this after I do the solo album or something, what did you say? Like, okay, like, so 15 years from now. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, so maybe 2030. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those, yeah, those guys were texting back and forth and, and uh, talking about it a lot. I mean, it's come up so often in interviews, you know, for forever and ever. When are you gonna do another? Will there be a liquid tension experiment, you know, reunion? And uh, we always said, you know, yeah, eventually there's no plans, but it would be nice. And then finally, you know, no, no more excuses. Like Mike said, with the pandemic, nobody was uh, on tour and it was just a matter of making it happen. So, um, and thankfully where I'm sitting right now is the dream theater studio. We had this place. So it was kind of like, man, just let's just do it here. It's, it's all set up. So we didn't have to deal with any uh, logistics. In fact, the drum kit that Mike used on my solo album, we just left here. And uh, <laughs> yeah, use that same one for this album. So sometimes that can get in the way, like how are we actually gonna make this happen, especially during the pandemic. Like if we didn't have this studio, I mean, would it suck to do something remote or whatever that would, right. you know? So everything came into, you know, fell into place. Very cool. It's, it's funny cause I ended up using John, John's drum set. <laughs> John has a kit and uh, I just got asked by some German drum magazine a couple of days ago. They wanted my gear specs for the, for that LTE album, and I was like, I don't even know. <laughs> I, don't know. <laughs> I, have, I don't have no idea. It was just it was just like a hodgepodge of gear. Like John had some drums. I brought some cymbals. Where there was some. I think we had a tambourine like duct taped onto one of the stands, and because it was the middle of the pandemic, so we couldn't even get like 
Tama or any companies to ship anything or send anything. Right. Everything, all the all the endorsement companies were shut down and the shipping, you know, the cartridge companies were shut down. So we just had to put together, you know, between what I had at my place and what John had at his place and the studio, you know, we just made it work. It sounds great. I mean, you you got me that kit, Mike, back when I was outfitting my studio at home. Yeah. Many years ago, you got me that kit through Tama and uh, it's just been at my house. And, you know, um, I mean, Raina's had many band practices on there and we recorded on it and stuff, but it hadn't moved. It's and got I a heard, lot of a lot of history on it now. It though. does. It's got, it's got the Terminal Velocity album and the LTE three exactly. album. Yeah. I took a picture of it, Mike. How about this? And Mike's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, it, it, I mean, it's been what? But, but whenever that process started, it had been about twelve years since you had d- done the reunion tour. Twenty-two years since you had, you know, actually recorded in the studio. You know, John, what? I mean, Mike talked about, you know, the relationships and the friendships were kind of in a good place. What was it actually like playing with the guys, you know, for the first time in a very, very long time? For and I suppose from the perspective of someone who's been in a band for a, a very, very long time as well. I, I mean, it was awesome on all levels. You know, we we had, I mentioned the studio here. My solo album was kind of the guinea pig album to work out the kinks. And so we knew that it would the setting would be right and we were set up drums would sound great guitars would sound great so there was none of that going in so we can literally just get started and you know one of the first things we did is we just jammed and we had these long jams and it was like man i know we've said this in all the press releases and everything but it really was like no time had passed um yeah. and we just the chemistry of us playing together i mean obviously mike and i have tremendous history with dream theater and that chemistry doesn't go away. And it was just like fun to see each other. You know, keep in mind, it was over the summer of 2020, you know, full on pandemic, yeah. just to be able to do something creatively in the same room with other musicians. Um, yeah. There was that, there's the friendship. Mike and I haven't, you know, played together and written together in so long. We've been hanging out and doing some fun things with the family, but to do something musically creative together um was amazing as it it was to do it with tony as well we all haven't seen tony in so long and you know it it was literally like continuation of the last one he brought his espresso machine in as he always (laughs) starts making espresso we start jamming jordan has his you know keyboards and his note paper and we're off to the races so it was amazing on on every level it really was a lot of fun a mic what, what do you think what do you think was the difference between uh mike portnoy 1998 who you know who last recorded and and uh mike portnoy 2020 who who came to the new album well my my hair was long again i and the, be- <laughs> the beard was longer the hair is grayer yeah um i think you know when we made those first two lte albums uh all those years ago, it was the first time that any of us had stepped out of Dream Theater. Uh, you know, it was the first time that John and I had done anything other than Dream Theater. And, uh, you know, it was very early in our career. I think we were, when we made those first two albums, it was after falling into infinity. Um, so, we, you know, we were still early in the Dream Theater, um, you know, uh, career. And, uh, you know, I, I think we were, at least I know I was a very different person back then. I think, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I was always a bit more controlling back then, a little bit more, you know, I think, I think I've mellowed out with age a little bit. I, I hope so, at least. And, uh, you know, obviously making this album, there's so much that has happened, you know, since we did those first two albums, you know, then after we did those first two albums, Jordan joined Dream Theater. And there was like a 10 year window with Jordan and, and John and myself together in Dream Theater and all that we did over those years and all those albums. And then then I left and, and uh, you know, it's been 10 years since that. So there's been everything that John's done, John and Jordan have done with Dream Theater without me. And there's all the stuff I've done since Dream Theater. So, I mean, there's just been so much history in those 22 years between albums mm-hmm. um, and, but, you know, as far as a different personality, I think, you know, I think 
the chemistry was the same. I think John, the, the way that John and I work together and also as well as with Jordan and Tony, there's a great, great musical chemistry, a very easy, quick camaraderie and a, a, a fast paced way of writing uh, together. And that's still very much the same. I mean, that style and that chemistry is still there and kind of the same in 2020. I think we've just all grown up a lot more. And not to mention personally as well, you know, when we made those first two albums, uh, John's kids were just born. My kids were just born. Uh, whereas now all of our kids are like in their twenties and out, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so there's just been so much since, since then. But I think the biggest difference is the, 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 uh, the beard and the gray hair. That's the biggest difference. <laughs> I think that'll go for jo John as well in terms of the beard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a tremendous record. Um, and the, the first singles out now passage of time and it's just, right right the liquid tension kind of kind of vibe it's amazing um one thing i'm curious about now because you recorded it and and many months ago by now is it different with um you know when you're working on a on a studio record with lyrics and you know things like that that's a bit more thought out um maybe that maybe you're more pleased at the time and and accepting of what that part is versus this kind of improv thing where many, many months later, is it, are you still wondering, could I have done that better? Could I have changed it? You know what I, you know what I mean? Is it cause you're working through that real fast? Right. I don't, I don't think so. Not, not personally, at least, you know, I, one of the beauties and what makes liquid tension or liquid tension uh, experiments. So such a cool thing to, to do, to experience together is that it is fast moving and decisions are made really quick and you don't look back. And that's what keeps the nature of this um, yeah. intact. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's it's a bit of a combination of things. There is improvisation and, and we use those elements obviously. And we kept, we, we actually, you know, have improvs uh, that, are, that are included on in the album as a bonus, uh, but a, a lot of it is composed as well. So, you know, it's not like we're just like one take, okay, that's it. Right, right. Um, I guess there are certain parts of that, you know, the, the duet between Jordan and I is the first and only take it right after we wrote the song, but there's a magic that you capture. And even when we were writing and, you know, everything was mic'd up. So Mike was playing and if what he played while we were writing was good, I, I believe you kept a lot of that, right, Mike? Yeah. Yep. So I think that spontaneity and keeping it in that spirit, you know, is really oh. super important with this project. You know, the last thing you want to do is overthink right. and start to polish it too much. And it loses the whole vibe. You know, it's instrumental music and there's a fun and loose and exciting thing to it. So yeah, no regrets on, on my awesome. end. No. And, and it's, like I said, it's a, it's a, there it's, oh, look at that. There it is right there. <laughs> no uh, regrets. Tremendous record. Uh, Jeff, any more questions uh, on the album? or? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, so I'm intrigued. Um, obviously, people will have heard the single, and probably the other thing from the album that they might have heard is, is Rhapsody in Blue because the live version of it came out. Um, what, what made you decide to pluck that one out for this album? Well, I thought that was one of the, the real highlights of the, uh, the 2008 reunion shows that we did um you know back then we 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 kind of came up with this prog metal arrangement of rhapsody in blue which was a, a song i always wanted to cover and then once we got together for those shows it was like well lte would be the perfect vehicle you know to to tackle this song uh so we put that together we played it on those at those shows and for me it was one of the highlights of those shows because it was really uh just a really really unique version and when we got together to do this album, uh, I suggested, why, you know, why don't we do a, a studio version of it? Just because, you know, uh, not many people got to see those shows back then and, and the CDs and the live DVDs that we put out were a very limited run. Uh, so, you know, sure enough, people could see it on YouTube and stuff like that, but it just felt like it would be nice to give it its proper day in the sun and really, you know, put it on the main album just to, give it its, its proper justice and and because uh, it really gets the LTE treatment. I mean, it almost sounds yeah. like it could have been something that we wrote ourselves. Yeah. It yeah. fits perfectly at home with the rest of the album. Yeah, yeah. I think 
and hats off to Mike for uh, suggesting that back in the day as a cover. You know, I be, everybody knows that song, but I never would have like thought, oh, let's do a cover of Rhapsody in Blue. But you had the idea and our arrangement is our kind of like LTE prog version. And like Mike said, when you hear it in the context of the other songs, it just fits right in. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to uh, our fun little topic here. So we have done a Top 5 Rush albums podcast many, many years ago. Um, which we did with uh, Jeff Wagner, who used to be my label uh, buddy, and um, uh, John Wesley, who was a, a good friend of Neil's. Uh, and that's a great podcast. So that you guys can check that out if you haven't yet. But what we're going to do today is try and pick the ultimate Rush album by putting together our favorite tunes and see if we could come up with something interesting. So uh, we're each going to pick three tracks. We'll go and ran, you know, round robin kind of order, and we'll end up with 12. So sort of a, a, a tough choice there to, to come up with only 12 out of this. So we'll see what we yeah. end up with. Um, and if anything from the 80s or 90s <laughs> makes it onto this thing. Um, all right. So uh, why don't we start? We'll give Mike the opening track on the album. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think we should also point out we're, we're not under any sort of rules here. So we can, anything goes and it doesn't need to be a, a greatest hits record. Tom Sawyer may not make it. Who knows? Um, no, no limits to songs from certain albums, all that kind of stuff. So with that said, Mike, why don't you uh, have at it? Well, this is a, this is a tough task. And, and like you said, like, do you want it to be a greatest hits album or do you want it to be a deep cuts album, you know, fan favorites? Um, you know, obviously if you're doing something like this, you have to have like the obvious ones, uh, right. Tom Sawyer, YYZ, blah, 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 spirit of radio. So I guess I'm going to, I'll start it off, but I'm going to kind of see where this goes and what, what you guys throw in there. And then that'll kind of like, there's certain ones I know I definitely want on there, but I think maybe one, one of you guys might pick them. So I'm going to have to tread carefully and we're, right. we're not doing a sequence or, or is this in sequence? Am I like picking the opening track of the album or is it not a sequence? I thought it'd be fun for the, yeah, I thought so. I, the only real sequence that we can be sure about would be opening track and closing track. So I thought it would be kind of cool to, to try and pin that on somebody. Uh, okay. So, um, well, the real uh, way to do this with Mike involved is do all 12 songs and let Mike sleep on it. <laughs> and oh, we need the whiteboard. He could pull out the whiteboard and write them all out. Yeah, he'll come up with the perfect sequence and get back to us. I think that's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye. Yeah. Well, we might do that. Let's see where it goes. I like that. I like that idea better. I'm yeah. telling you. This yeah. way, there's no pressure on the order. Totally. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll put that. We'll put the order together after. Let's do that. That's fine. All right. Well, I, I know the ones I definitely need to be in there but i'm going to hold off on those i'm going to i'm going to come out of the gates with a uh maybe a deeper cut just so i make sure it gets in the list right and uh oh god there's so many to choose from but i'm going to go with uh a strange choice but man there's like three i'm toying with in my head <laughs> but i'm going to uh, i'm going to go with bitor and the snow dog oh man wow okay <laughs> yeah. I, I for some reason i knew you were going to go there the, I, don't, I don't know why. I there's a few why. I'm toying with, but that would be the earliest. Yeah, uh, yeah I personally when I, I would my my favorite albums begin with Fly By Night because of Neil. Obviously, I love the first album as well, but obviously as a drummer, especially uh, Neil is was such an important ingredient. So for me, you know, this would be the earliest track that I could throw out there. That, it's my favorite track on the Fly By Night album. Uh, it was kind of their first mini epic. It was their first time toying with like sci-fi, uh, you know, fictional lyrics. I love uh, the drum solos in the middle between all the, the breaks with the drum solos and everything. It really kind of was a great introduction to Neil and his style. So there's so many reasons I love that song, but uh, I'm going to throw that out there. And, and, and I'm looking at my li my master list here and there's so many I could have went with, but. <laughs> Just for the chronological sake of kicking it off, I'll go with that one. Nice. All right, that's cool. Yeah, I did, that's I sort of thought you might come out of the gate with like twenty one twelve or something, but that's you know, yeah, yeah, that's cool. A big part of this game is kind of sitting back and waiting to see what you <laughs> right. guys do too. Exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm curious. All right, Jeff, uh, and you did gonna... you did a you did a great cover. You were involved in the cover of that, weren't you, on the Working Man album, Mike, as well by tour. Actually, there's a funny story about that. I'll quickly tell mm -hmm. it. But yeah, actually, whatever whatever list we end up coming up with here, I think uh, 
myself and John have probably covered almost all of these. Yeah, really. <laughs> probably. Between yeah. the Working Man album I did and my Cygnus and the Sea Monsters tribute band I did, and then all the Dream Theater covers we did. I mean, we did so many through the years. I mean, we're going to end up covering most of this list. But the quick story with the Bi Tour uh, version we did on uh, the Working Man album, it was actually um, Billy Sheehan on bass and uh, James Labrie, I think, sang it as yep. well. Uh, yeah, yeah. But my old vinyl, my old Fly By Night vinyl um, had a skip uh, right after that. Boom, bad, 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 boom, bad, bad, boom, bad. There was, um, oh, no, no, no. It was the very end of the song. Uh, there's like, they're doing those rhythms and my record, my vinyl had a skip in it. So I always was used to hearing a different rhythm because oh of the God. skip. <laughs> like it, it was at the end, like, like, so I was used to that rhythm. So when, when we did our version on Working Man, I actually put that rhythm into our version. So uh, rather than oh, doing Rush's originally intended ending of the song, we did my, my vinyl skipping version instead that's awesome uh, that's great. Did, did did the prog fans write letters i mean i think i think they would you know? it, it was that was probably that was that was before, before, social internet, internet, that was before social media so yeah but now they can talk by. about it yeah yeah that's cool all right jeff we'll let you go uh with your with number two great okay um yeah what can i say tricky um but but i have a list um I, i'm gonna pick for my first choice red barchetta Okay, perfect. Um, obviously, yeah. from moving pictures, and I mean, I think what it captures that's something I really like about Rush, pro probably kind of from that era forward, is this combination of um, the really brilliant match between the music and the lyrics, and you know, the the cinematic stuff, you know, the, you know, a music about being in an open car and you listen to it and that's what it feels like it doesn't need to tell you that that's completely what you know that that section feels like that you're driving you know you're on the road um and i also also read actually when i was just doing a bit of prep that that was i think it was the main track of that was a one take you know so oh wow it's very very cool um so yeah, Red Barchetta is. And actually, we while we're first. recording this, I think we're days away from the 40th anniversary of Moving Pictures. So amazing, good Great. timing there as well. Which is that's amazing. 40 years. Wow. And every year there's a new big anniversary for Rush albums now, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> which is wild. And we're coming up. Well, sp speaking of which, I just did a, a another round robin kind of podcast a few days ago with a bunch of other drummers, specifically talking about Moving Pictures. And uh, Charlie Benante was part of it as well. And he spent a little time talking about Red Barchetta. And just like, like you were saying, Jeff, uh, the lyrics about, you know, really puts you in a certain place in time, uh, you know, being a young kid and being in the open air in the car. But that first side of moving pictures, those four tracks, is just really the perfect album side. Tom yeah, Sawyer, yeah. Red Barchetta, YYZ, Limelight. I mean, that, you don't get a better album side than that. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, sure. amazing. Uh, okay, God, I'm I'm up. Wow. All right, so I'll go. Man, I wasn't ready to be up so soon. Um, okay, so let's see. My list <laughs> is yeah, it's pretty diverse. It's all eras, and I'm trying to decide if I want to go kind of later, more modern rush or older. Um, I'm gonna go with um, all right, just because I like this song and I like this part, and I don't know where it's gonna come later. But I'm gonna go. Uh, subdivisions good one and uh nice. that's just a song that i still never get sick of i think it's just so cool and lyrically just uh, still amazing still pertinent to you know everyday life that uh, you know i like the lyrics that started from moving pictures on a little bit better I, he was writing a bit more direct a bit more what was going on in the world that kind of stuff versus things like xanadu and stuff which it's a whole different thing, but um, yeah, I like love that track. One of my all time favorites. Subdivisions is uh, that's mine and John's. That's how we grew up. Like, yeah, that, you, you see that video for when they put out the video for subdivisions. It could have been filmed at either of our high schools, you know, yeah. on Long Island and growing up in Long Island, you know, in 1981, 82, 83. I mean, Rush were our band, even though they were Canadian, but as Long Islanders and suburban Long Island and being really into 
the way they played and being a young forming musician. I mean, that was our childhood. And Subdivisions was a rare example, kind of like Tom Sawyer or Spirit of Radio, where even though it was a hit song and it was all over the radio, it still had so much musicality to it. It wasn't like a sellout track. It was right. even when they were able to scale down these songs to these radio hits, there was still so much substance there. And Subdivisions is a great example of that. Yeah, I love that synth solo. It's just so memorable. Yeah. It's just so perfect. Very cool. All right, John, you want to go with your first pick? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if this is a faux pas, but when Mike does the order, he can mix it around. But I feel like sticking with that record, the first tour he went to, or the first live show he went to was Rush on the Signals tour. So I was like- Same 15. here. Yeah. I, was, I think it was the same show, I think. Yeah, at the Coliseum. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like 15 years old. So all those records that came out, you know, Signals, um, Power Windows, Grace Under Pressure, Hold Your Fire, like that period of the 80s, like I just have such vivid memories of going to Rush concerts and being just like blown away by the whole experience. Um, and, you know, we mentioned Neil before and, and Neil is my lyric writing, you know, hero. And I just love always loved his approach. And I love that he had this sort of positive approach when he picked topics. And uh, one of the songs that just blew me away whenever they played it live was Countdown from mm -hmm. Signals. And the, you know, the fact that he wrote about this great moment in history of the space shuttle launch and everything, and the way they did it with the, uh, the samples of all the you know, NASA uh, chatter and the countdown and Mike remember seeing that live and it was just totally. you felt like the whole place was going to lift off yeah um just just a brilliant brilliant song so I'm going with very countdown. cool down all right that is uh out of the box there a little bit yeah. so good. that's a great that was yeah. what that was I think the other video they did for signals as well I mean for us as you know as Rush fans in 1982 or 83 you know you only had MTV so the, the only way you could see Rush was if they were showing the, the subdivisions video, the countdown video, uh, Limelight, Tom Sawyer, and then yeah. that MTV concert. So yeah, Countdown was one of the big ones that like, I, I remember just <laughs> watching that video over and over. And I, I just love that. I, I just, it, you know, because with the other records, I was I, I didn't see them live, you know, I wasn't there to see uh, hemispheres or any of that stuff. So right. we started seeing them you know, like from signals on. So those those memories are so vivid, those first. So it didn't bother you at that point that they shifted into like keyboard era and all that. It was at you know, all. right it in the middle rushed. of it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, Just that's cool. Me. Yeah. All right, Mike, back to you. Uh, Well, 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 so far, I, I, I'm gonna go with another strange one. I mean, it's not strange. If you're a Rush fan, you're going to love this one. But uh, this is one of the more obscure ones that I always loved. Uh, oh God, I'm looking. I'm looking at the ones I'm not picking. No one is oh, making man. me crazy. I know. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go with uh, Jacob's Ladder, uh, just nice. to pick a, a deep cut that's always okay. been yep. a personal favorite. Um, that I mean, I love everything on the Permanent Waves album. I think that probably is my favorite Rush album. And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier how moving pictures had the perfect side one, but you could, there's something to be said for the same with uh, uh, Permanent Waves, side one being Spirit of Radio, Free Will, and Jacob's Ladder. I mean, it's just incredible. Jacob's Ladder is a, a deep cut. Like, they didn't play it much. They, it was on the Exit Stage Left album. Uh, and then they kind of put it, you know, put it on the back burner for decades and then they brought it back at the very end i think the last tour i saw yeah i think it was busted on the last it out tour, again yeah. and uh we we played it uh dream theater played it we had this tradition uh back when when i was in the band that anytime we played toronto we always put a one-off um rush cover in into the set and you know, we did all these one-offs we did passage to bangkok one year we did camera eye one year but one of the years we did jacob's ladder as well and uh the middle section, the uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six. I, I don't remember if it's five and six or six and seven. I don't remember offhand. But that little passage is one of the most difficult, challenging drum parts of Neil's that I've ever had to learn. It was really hard to get comfortable with that. And uh, so uh, there's so many reasons why I love that song. But uh, I'll put it on this list because it's kind of like one of those forgotten classics and want to make sure it gets its... Uh, its, its yeah, I think here. it's it's one of those sort of under underrated... Uh 
a rush fan kind of deep cuts that everybody likes it seems like it comes up a lot when we do these things amazing Um, i remember that cover and i remember playing it what what a great vibe that was and uh with the molson amphitheater i guess yeah yeah Yeah. really cool cool hey jeff you got a pick yeah, no, you see, I, I'm I'm torn between my my favorites and my choices on on the making of the album here because because there's there's lots from this era that I could pick that I think are really good, but but I feel I should go early. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm gonna go early. Um, I, I'm gonna go twenty one twelve. Yeah. Um, be, because I think it it probably for me it's it's the encapsulation of of kind of probably everything up to that point um in an epic track and you know if we're if we're prog report um type people to me it's you know to me it's up there with close to the edge um you know on those kind of epics except it's it's also got a story that goes through it um which kind of obviously things like yes lyrics didn't really have much of that um you know and the first time I heard that song was actually on the the VHS video of a show of hands, and they played it. And, and at that stage, I was really I wasn't familiar with the early stuff, and it was like, "What's this one?" And uh, yeah, went and explored it and found it. I think maybe in that video they only played like the first kind of two two parts or something like that. Um, but went and heard this whole thing that's a story and it's the narrative and. Um, obviously, you know the the tuning of the guitar and like all the flamenco stuff. Even even the overture of that, you know, you know the quote of eighteen twelve, the eighteen twelve overture in it, the, the kind of nearly flamenco sort of style of the of the kind of rhythm. Just so much inventiveness and creativity throughout there that actually, you know, sounds. You know, it doesn't it doesn't really sound like anything else in kind of this thing that we call prog. You know. Um, and I think it's just simply a classic. Awesome. Yeah. H- had to be on the list. So yeah, I'm glad you put be. it in I was, I was listening to it today again, just to revisit it again. And it always trips me out when he just starts <sighs> tuning the guitar. Yeah. To put that in the middle of the song. I wonder if the record company was just like, do eh, <laughs> you want to take that part out? And they're like, no, he's tuning yeah. the guitar. We're leaving it in. So many memories. Once again, just, you know, drop the needle and just like totally just getting into that album, you know? Yeah what what memories and what an experience just and and like nothing else out there you know and and you know did that recording wise and everything it sounds really good still yeah that's what i think is the way they record it the instruments the the guitar sound everything sounds really solid still which i think that was their first really great sounding album um and and you know they worked with terry brown through all those albums and then even later uh paul northfield john and i you know Kind of always, we always tapped into the the Rush, you know, sonic teams. You know, we worked with Paul Northfield and Terry Brown, and uh, you know, we uh, Hugh Syme. You know, all the people that are in the Rush camp, we always, uh, you know, strive to for that level of excellence. They always had such a level yeah. of excellence. But sonically, I think Twenty One Twelve, uh, Farewell to Kings, Hemispheres, Permanent Waves, Moving Pictures, they all sonically just sound yeah so clean and great. But the only missed opportunity with Twenty One Twelve. It was a missed opportunity. The length should have been 21 minutes and 12 seconds. They oh should man! Have been. I mean, that is <laughs> that's a, a Mike. Missed... That's a Mike detail that if you were there, you would have made it happen. Oh, Absolutely, definitely. it was such a missed opportunity. And, yeah. and you know, you could have had Alex tuning his guitar just a little longer, a little shorter, <laughs> just to get to it. <laughs> that's really fun. <laughs> that would have been great. Yeah, you're right, man. That is awesome. Brilliant. Um, good. I'm glad you picked that because that was that was going to be one of my next choices. So since you went all the way back, I'm going to go a lot forward and if there was one kind of 90s era song that i was going to put on uh it was going to be this one because i love this song so i'm going to go animate from counterparts great one. um just straight up rocker killer guitar riff love that just how the drums come in in the beginning and i love his drumming on that song too it's just so solid and like in the pocket and everything is amazing um and I like that return to the guitar that they did on that album. I, I think that's a really underrated album by them. I really like that uh, counterpart. Great album. Yeah, once again, another example of uh, somebody that worked on it that we wanted, We ended up working with. Kevin Shirley engineered that album. I love right. the one-two the one punch of Animate and Stick It Out opening yeah. that album. Yeah. Was so great. Yeah. yeah. 
amazing. Yeah, stick it out. So that's that's a real dark, heavy riff for them at yeah. that time, which is you know surprising then. Love um, it. And I, I think about it. That was what ninety five, ninety six. Um, to come out in the right in the middle of the grunge era with an album that sort of totally fit, and they found a way to be on radio yeah. still. I and mean, that's an amazing thing back yeah. then. Yeah. Cool. I thought good. I'm glad you guys liked that choice. I wasn't sure about that one, but I I wanted to make sure that was in there. Uh, All right, Uh, John. All right, I'm I'm gonna uh, put up my. (laughs) Oh, I thought you were were gonna say you had to go. uh, (laughs) I got a a deli order arriving. (laughs) (laughs) No, I I was gonna say I'm I'm gonna put on my guitar player hat uh, because Alex is such a tremendous tremendous influence on me in so many ways um just his style his sound his lead playing i mean even just from the first rush album like just those songs that went off on these ridiculous jams um so going back to uh when i mentioned the first concert i ever went to being rush at nassau coliseum um they played this one song that just like it as paul gilbert would say it just melted my face and I've <laughs> never heard like a guitar player play in, in, in that way. And it was when they did La Via Strangiato. Uh, and it's like, for a few reasons, just again, the amazing guitar playing in that song, that whole middle section breakdown that they build up slowly. And he kind of goes from these volume swells into bluesy notes and then by the end, he's like ripping insane. I'm getting the chills just remembering it. Yeah. Um, not only because of that, because Hemispheres is one of my favorite albums of all time, um, but also because, you know, Rush had that instrumental side, yeah. which was a huge influence on me, on, on Mike, on Dream Theater. Obviously, we're talking about Liquid Tension Experiment, which is all instrumental. So hearing Rush, you know, play an all instrumental piece like that and and you know kind of knowing the funny story behind it i think it was based on one of alex's dreams or something and there's all these parts i mean it's just classic classic rush and prog with the parts and the themes and has a little bit of comedy in there and just killer killer sick playing where you really get to hear those three musicians and why we hold them in such high regard you know that's that's a great one Yep, that had to be on here too. That was one of the other ones that that we had to make sure we put on here. Good choice. I think, isn't it? Isn't it subtitled? Uh, was it an exercise in self indulgence? Right. You know? That's right. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I do. I mean, wasn't that recorded in? Uh, I don't know. That was Wales. I was thinking where uh, Belfast, where you are, but no, it was actually Wales. I think Wales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. In 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 Wales, a rock, a rock rock field where uh, Bohemian Rhapsody and stuff like that was recorded. The other the thing funny, I, I had it on my long list as well. And the thing when I was thinking about it is, you know, there is that whole metal fusion, and then there's these little bursts of kind of almost like. You know, cartoon music, I suppose, yeah. would be how I would describe it. Oh. And, and that's very much a trait that you would also hear in in, uh, in Liquid Tension. Uh, with Jordan, you know, often the keyboard, you have this, those little bits as well, you know. So yeah. it's, a, yeah, it's a great, a well, great parallel right. to what you guys do. That, that's, you know, their music was always seen as very, very serious, but that whole side of them that they would bring to uh, the live shows and the videos they produce and everything yeah. was that they were hysterical. I mean, they like yeah. the comic. Yeah nature between them so you hear it come out in the music and you hear that playfulness and it's a really cool side that's one of my, one of my favorite neil quotes is he says uh people think we don't you know that we, we take ourselves so, too seriously but he says no it was not the quote was something like we even take our comedy seriously right <laughs> <laughs> well the only the only time that i ever saw them live because they actually there was a long period of time where they well they certainly didn't come to ireland but the, even in the uk um, and obviously there was a period they didn't tour, but it was that Time Machine t- uh, tour that they did. And like the comedy stuff in it is absolutely, you know, they have all the different kind of eras that they go through. And Alex is this massive, big, fat kind of guy. Yeah. And even Neil is, I think he's like a sort of an Irish kind of policeman, sort of New York yeah. policeman. And it right. is really, really hilarious watching it. Yeah. Um, where were we? All right. So you are, uh, we're on your last pick, Mike, right? Yep. Well, I'm glad John picked La Via because it. I was going being this is my last pick. I was going to throw La Via in there because it had to be on there, but 
John did it. So thank God for that. And I guess I could pick something else now. But yeah, just final thought on Livia Strangiato. For me, that's mm. has to be on this list. It's actually my personal favorite Rush song of all. It's my number one favorite Rush song. And to me, it was always the ultimate, uh, you know, bar. You know, they, they rose the bar, the bar of instrumental and technical playing and individual playing to such a level with that. That was, you know, when I was in high school, that was always the benchmark that was like you you strive to achieve and you had to know how to play La Via Strangiato. And sure enough, you know, they came out with YYZ years later, which became, you know, their more well-known instrumental. But for me, La Via was always the benchmark. Yeah. But okay, so with that now in the, officially in the mix, I could pick something else. Um, I guess there's so many. I mean, do I go with, you know, something like Tom Sawyer, Spirit of Radio, YYZ, that has to be in there or... Uh, I picked one from from Permanent Waves. I picked one from Fly By Night. So I got. I want to get a different album represented. All right, uh, this has to be on the list. If I didn't pick it, I'm sh maybe one of you would have. But now I'm freeing you guys up in case. Okay. Uh, this has to be on the list. Xanadu. I mean, it's. I think oh, it's right. one, of, yeah. one oh, yeah. of the greatest in their catalog. It's it's just a, a perfect perfect song. Um, this was uh, you know their first album after 2112 when they came out with Farewell to Kings. And, uh, you know, uh, Xanadu and Cygnus X1 were kind of like the mini epics on that album. But to me, Xanadu was just pure perfection. And uh, even like, uh, you know, they always kept that in the, in the set list. And, and uh, the last tour that I saw them, uh, both Getty and Alex came out with the double necks, you know, which they hadn't played side That's by side so in all those years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so classic. And, and the intro with all Neil's percussion and the wood blocks and everything. And uh it's just one of those perfect perfect songs that absolutely has to be on this list yeah agreed great, great that's one of the, the big prog epics yep um yeah. and neil's i i believe uh i'm not a, a a neil scholar like john probably is but i believe those lyrics are all about uh citizen kane i right and uh uh, drink the milk of honeydew and right. Khan. I think it, it's a lot of it is based on the movie Citizen Kane. I I think. Yeah, I, I don't want to get that info wrong. So right. <laughs> I, I, something like that. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll yeah. have the I mean, people commenting on YouTube right away, letting us yeah. know what you know what part of that we got Call right or wrong. So. Fans. He was. Yeah. I think he was referencing uh, SpongeBob. <laughs> <laughs> It's does SpongeBob the, uh, does he dine on Honeydew? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> it's from the uh, Olivia Newton-John movie, right? <laughs> all right, uh, all right, Jeff. You did it. You did a cover of that quite re on one of the reissues, John, didn't you? Yeah, you were, yeah, we did. Yeah. We did. Uh, Dream Theater did Xanadu. We recorded it um, at on the road. Um, you know, at sound checks and stuff, and got that together for their fortieth, um, for for that record. And I, I I agree with Mike. Just classic, classic. It's it's funny because like there are certain things that when you hear Alex's guitar parts, I don't know the way that the kind of chords he picks. Sometimes you're not exactly sure what it is. You you think you know what it is. And like, you'll go along playing something wrong for years and years and years. And I remember for that, I just wanted to get this certain part right. And I uh, watched the live video, probably one of the ones maybe, did you reference it before, Mike, with the, what's the famous one where, like the most famous live version of that? Um, well, there's like two, right? Like there's these videos I'm talking about. One was like a little bit later where the filming was a little better and you can see his hands. I remember trying to pick, I finally picked out the way the chords were actually mm. played. Cool. Was, was he on the double neck for that? Cause yeah. that was always visually, that was the song where they both came out with the double neck. Yeah, he was on the double neck. There's one, like, I think there's like an earlier uh, film of it where they're all um, like in the kind of silky robe vibe. It's on exit stage left, I think. Right. Isn't it? It, the video with that. It's like a later 80s. one. Yeah, I, actually, the exit stage left video. I remember the first time I saw that was uh, when MTV first started around 81, 82. They used to have this thing called MTV Concerts every weekend. And uh, that one of the weekends they showed the exit stage left video. And uh, I videotaped it, of course. Um, 
and I ended up wearing out my VHS like home recorded tape, just watching <laughs> right. it over yeah. and over and over. But actually, talking about Exit Stage Left, if you're putting together the ultimate Rush album, I think that right there, pretty good, yeah, yeah. It, that <laughs> is pretty much taking all of the classics from those four albums: Farewell to Kings, Hemispheres, Permanent Ways, Moving Pictures, and all, they're all there on that album. So, to me, that's almost like the Desert Island Rush album. Yeah, right true. There. Yeah. It was uh, we've I've talked about this a few times in podcasts about how it wasn't you know it seems to me in that era it wasn't really cool nobody really did greatest hits and so if you wanted to explore a band and find a selection of stuff you went for the live album and I remember you know it was the first Genesis album I got was Three Sides Live you know and kind of that was you know Queen Live Killers was the first Queen album I got because it had yes, lots songs. of songs yes songs yeah, was yeah, a big yeah, one yeah. too yeah yeah so yeah. although Rush had one of the best compilation albums that when they came out with the chronicles that was the one that we all got into that didn't know the earlier stuff and you know right. that kind of stuff chronic yeah. everybody had chronicles and that was just like if you weren't a rush fan that was sort of a gateway to, to getting into them so did a good one there uh jeff your last pick okay um so i think my first choice is red barchetta which i think is fairly safe pick 2112, 2112. i did it to get some some early in so i, I i'm gonna do my indulgence pick which might be my favorite rush song um and it's um marathon from par windows you know it's fun i i was gonna say that one <laughs> that was on my list that's a yeah. great well, i know it's that's on roy's i know it's on yeah, roy's list awesome. because roy texted song. me Roy texted me last night saying, isn't Marathon a great th song? And I replied, don't you dare, don't you dare. <laughs> I, 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 th I think, you know, what can I say about it? Uh, you know, I, again, I, we often have this debate amongst the Prog Report guys where I, I'm very into words and lyrics. And I know that kind of some of the guys are more into the musical side of things. And I go, was not, you know, isn't verse three of that great? And they go, there's words, is there? You know, <laughs> I think the thing about, about, about Rush is, just the sheer the mastery of of neil peart's lyrics and and that you know i mean it's a, a carpe diem message really marathon is it's about you know you can you know do all you can and just try not to burn out um doing it and you know this brilliant it's you know it's the metaphor it's the layers within it that i just really like plus musically it's amazing you know the ending where that kind of i mean i know it's a it's a kind of a synth sound but that kind of like angelic it's nearly like a mellotron you know comes in you know it's just such a soundscape with the words um just on it's an unbeatable track for me yeah and I, love, I, I agree no his bass playing on that song is insane that's the thing that's yeah. i mean he's just ripping in that in that song and then that chorus is just one of their best. I mean, it's just so catchy and anthemic and just really, really good, catchy, incredible song. I love I love the whole Power Windows album. And I, I have so many memories with John, actually, from that album, because that was the album that came out. Uh, it was the first Rush album that came out after you and I met. Right. We met at Berkeley and we were both, me, you and John Myung as well, were all such big big rush fans and rush fanatics but power windows was the album that came out when we were together at berkeley in fact i think the night we came up with the name majesty we were sleeping out for tickets for the power windows tour outside the berkeley performance center and we saw that tour together i think we saw it i remember seeing it twice i think we saw it in worcester and uh, also at the nassau coliseum i think yeah. one one of the nights was marillion opening on their misplaced childhood album and the other time was the Steve Morse band opening. So yeah. I have a lot of memories of that album with you, John. I mean, to me, that was like, absolutely brings back so many memories of Berkeley and then coming back to Long Island. And I remember we listened to that album so much and loved uh, Peter Collins production was so great on it. And that's, that's right in that sweet spot, you know, cause what, what was that? Like that'd be 85, like in that zone. Yeah. 85, 86. Yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, and we were like 18 years old, you know, just, at college, like Mike said, that whole mid right in that sweet spot of the mid eighties was, yeah. you know, that was like, it was all about rush and maiden. <laughs> yeah. Sleeping totally. out for concert tickets. That's, yeah. a, that's a great thing that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. Great. Uh, memory. Yeah. That's great. All right. So I, li I like that choice coming right after a few heavy hitters. Uh, we had Livia and then we had Xanadu and now, and then we had marathon. So that's pretty good. Um, 
All right, so I'm going to go back to um, to to the Moving Pictures album since it is coming up on the 40th anniversary, and we only picked one song from it. Um, and we mentioned it before. I guess I'll go ahead and, and mention YYZ then, um, which I think also belongs on this list and another favorite of, of mine. Um, and when you put it next to La Via Strangiato, like those are two instrumentals that are so completely different, and they are both amazingly brilliant and you know yyz is a song where an entire audience of people will be singing along to it like Mm -hmm. it has lyrics i mean it's just so amazing how how it's written um so yeah and i think that's that's uh, that's a hit song for them for (laughs) you know so we had to have one more off of moving pictures and i just i think like the rest of you probably didn't want to put tom sawyer so i'm gonna go yyz nice you guys do that one before, right? Uh, oh, actually, I think we did YYD. Well, speaking of which, I think we uh, did that at Berkeley. I think it was one of the first Majesty, oh, wow. one of the first the things demos, we demoed yeah. on my uh, on my four track recorder. It was like one of the first recordings we ever did was a uh, a cover of YYZ. Right. Huh. I mean, that was that was, you know, the the, was, the, the was, gold standard. What- Exactly. Yeah. It's one of those those other like rite of passage songs. Like you had right. to you had <laughs> to be able to play that. YYZ. You know, yeah. as soon as if the drummer started going into that that yeah. pattern, you know, <laughs> if you didn't know it, you're out. <laughs> Get out of here. That sounds like I thought that, that was like such a clever thing too, to actually take uh Morse code for the letters YYZ, which was, of course was the the their uh airport uh code or whatever but then to actually take the morse code and then write music to the morse code yeah. was such a clever clever thing to do i know it, it it really was and it's like it's such a great example of their songwriting skills to take you know a, a, to create an instrumental piece of music that's kind of like structured as you know as its own song like comp- comprehensive song where it has like almost verses and choruses and and theme yeah. And it's just so interesting the whole way. And if there's nothing about it that meanders or gets boring, you know, and, and you wonder how like, how they thought of that. You know, it's just, you listen to it now. It's like, man, those are classic riffs and melodies and things. Unbelievable. Yep. yep. Amazing. Cool. Uh, okay, John, you get the last pick. Oh, boy. There's a lot of lot to choose from now. There is yeah. a lot to choose from. <laughs> I, you know, I, I kind of, I started this whole thing talking about the, the era that I'm, I'm fondly familiar with, even though there's all, again, the, the past stuff that's just so epic. And, you know, we talked about Neil and it's, we all miss him and, you know, it was such a tragic loss. And, and when certain lyrics hit me that came from his perspective, again, of looking at life and just having this positive spin on it, um one of the songs that comes to mind again I, I just remember myself watching this like live was uh mission from hold your fire and it just mm. it just has such a positive vibe to it you know positive message it's just really heartfelt and uh, you know i think the vocals are great on it i think it's a great song and it exemplifies like it kind of caps off, you know, that period for me. Cause I guess that was, it would be like towards the end of the eighties, right? 87, um, 88, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and when was permanent waves like 80 or 80 uh, first week of 1980 actually was yeah. one of the very first albums of the eighties. Yeah. So, you know, kind of starting there and then just capping off at that point um, again, brings back just unbelievable memories of being in a con in a venue you know just packed sold out and they always had just tremendous production you know with their uh lasers and and video and it was like like mike said it was something to uh to uh, you know strive towards as a professional as as people trying to make it and it was kind of like what would rush do you know and i remember watching mission it was just always such a moving song you know it just it really hit me and reached me and and again uh just brilliant lyrical imagery imagery by uh the late great neil Peart. nice yeah that, yeah i mean that's sort of a surprise pick too but great um we really covered uh a lot and we left out 
All the two thousands. Now I'm looking at my master list. What what is shocking here is what isn't on our yeah, final exactly twelve. It's, right. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking here like natural science, the trees, uh, hemispheres, free will, spirit of radio. I mean, passage to Bangkok. I mean, uh, it's just a, it's a ama- it just just goes to show you how incredible their catalog is. Uh, but yeah, you do a double it, it, album, Mike. Yeah, totally. totally. <laughs> all all the ones that you mentioned were like, I, those are the first things that came to mind. You know, yeah. free will, so, natural science, the well, tree. It's like, man, how could you? Yeah, when, when no, you, make, I, you know what? These things make, sort of when we do these these podcasts, they just take a life of their own and they just go in one direction. You look back and you go, oh wow, we didn't pick you know Spirit of the Radio. So, but that's my, fine. My I like honorable. This list. My honorable mentions were uh, Red Tide. I love it. Yeah. Uh, Distant Early Warning. Yeah. Um, I think it's, oh, it's a great one. Great how, how they incorporated the keyboards and stuff in that. Um, and earlier, Anthem, which again, I think was like their first ever sort of jam. Um, well, that, that was and, their uh, first, that was your first time hearing Neil was Anthem because it opened up Fly yeah. By Night. And yeah. Uh, yeah, the the kind of the this sort of the diff the, the the shift even the in the lyrics you know where it kind of Neil is doing his thing right from that very first you know hi I'm the drummer I'm going to write lyrics about you know totalitarianism oh, okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know as compared to in the mood hey baby it's a quarter to eight you know right right it it, it really shifted but yeah yeah other well, we can, other choices I had uh, considering were Analog Kid uh, yeah. Bravado. Um, and actually Caravan from the, the last record, which I think is great. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and Natural Science was another one. So, yeah, but this is great. So, Mike, how do we put this in, in an order? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking at this. I mean, to, to me, the opening track, it's, it's either Animate or Subdivisions, both of which opened up their respective albums. Uh, although there would be something to be said for opening with 2112. But no, I, I would say open with... Uh, Animate, I think it was a great opener. And then you follow that up with Subdivisions as the second track. Then Red Barchetta and why it, Red Barchetta into YYZ. So you get those back to back as we know them back to back. Right. Uh, then I, I always look when sequencing an album or, or a set list, I always look at the beginning and the end. So that would be the beginning. And I think towards the end, I want to close with La Via Strangiato. Uh, oh wait, but you have YYZ in twenty. I'm gonna. I may have to get back to you on this one. <laughs> <laughs> this take a while. Yeah, I mean, I think the closers, the obvious closers, would be either La Via, or uh, maybe closing with twenty one twelve, which could be pretty climactic with the grand finale. Um, I don't know. It's tough, and then everything in the <laughs> middle is kind of like interchangeable. Although countdown should be towards the end as well. It's a tough call. It's a tough call. It, it's Our the only people. podcast you get homework on. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. It's so funny when thinking about this, like in my mind, you know, there, there's the period where I, I started really getting into guitar. You know, I started when I was 12, by the time I was 15, like I said, signals came out. So there's that whole period Mike and I have been talking about from early eighties on, but then like, it's kind of splits for me if you go backwards that's like all that like amazing stuff from the first album up to permanent waves that's probably the more you know progressive and wild hemispheres natural science stuff you know that's more experimental but it's all to me it's all great it's all incredible yeah you know no, it's it's one it, of the amazing yeah. catalogs and for any any group really yeah because they change i mean they went through four decades and they change all their different styles and everybody seems more or less okay with all of it yeah you know, which is they always common. kept it in they always stayed relevant always kept it interesting and you can always count when you went to a rush concert it was going to be an incredible experience it was sold out you know i mean how many bands can do that you know and that was like yeah. with all these different stylistic changes happening in music that didn't really matter rush was on their own trajectory trajectory that's a hard word to say trajectory and uh and you know we all love you them. think uh alex and getty will end up doing anything not not getting a drummer and doing rush but just like the two of them doing doing anything because alex sort of referred to maybe that happening recently yeah i I saw heard that he said you know said that but who knows let's call him you got his uh you got the hotline (laughs) (laughs) i I call right here there you go Uh, one other thing we should say also is uh it's amazing that over this incredible career 
it was the, just the, with the exception of the first album, but starting in 1974, it was just the three of them. And yeah. that was it. No lineup changes. It was literally the three of them for 40 years. I mean, how many bands go 40 years with the same lineup? I, I, I don't, I don't know if any yeah. exist. I think ZZ Top might be the only ZZ one. Top. But if you say U2 or The Police or any any bands like that, they also didn't have a 40-year span. Right. You know, it was yeah. that is a long, long run without a, a lineup change. And you could look at any of our favorite bands or any of our <laughs> bands. You know, like they, it, it just doesn't it doesn't it happen. happen. You it look might. at um, Metallica, Maiden. I mean, Sabbath. None of them. You know, I think uh, Rush is one of the few exceptions where they never had a lineup change for all those years. I have well, one I think... for it for a long career span that never changed. Liquid tension experiment. <laughs> 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 but you could get away with that when you take 22 years off. In right, the middle. exactly. That's, yeah. how the, that's how the police can claim that as well, you know? <laughs> exactly. That's true. That's a true. good point. And without, like John said, without, you know, there's a lot of bands who you can go, that was the really rubbish album <laughs> you know the, the you know the the experiment that didn't work and there was there was there's nothing in rush yeah, at all that's true yeah. it's all great it's all great and we loved and i just their shows just kind of exemplified that because they would go from playing something super i don't know name like a super old i don't know maybe they play working man or something right. and then it yeah. would go into something from like the 90s and it just all worked yeah, I loved yeah. uh, the last tour that they did, the, the 40th anniversary tour b before they retired. Uh, the set list was a Rush fan's wet dream. I mean, really, if, look up that set list. And that, to me, was like the ultimate Rush set list. And they did it in backwards chronological order. So it started mm -hmm. with the newest stuff. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, if, for those that saw the tour, you know, but their gear even changed. So as they were going back in time, the gear was shrinking or expanding, depending on the era. And it was just brilliant the way they did that. You know, it had the intermission and then the second half, Neil brought out his old kit and the way they did that. And then the whole show ended with them playing, uh, I guess it was either Working Man or In The Mood, you know, from the first album. And, and, and the background was like a high school auditorium. And they yeah, were- it's, uh, a, it's a really cool- Alex and uh, Getty were way to combo amps. It, yeah. was, it was perfectly done. It was a perfect, Amazing. perfect farewell from those guys. Amazing. There's, a, yeah. there's only one thing that Rush did that I didn't like. And that they would do. Ah, uh, I know what it is. And Mike knows what it is. <laughs> what is it, Mike? Uh, I well, I'm trying to remember how the song goes. It was uh, <laughs> I fucking John always hated the Rush medleys. I always loved the Rush medleys. <laughs> right, but what right. was the what was the song was, we had? I fucking hate when Rush does medleys. <laughs> or won't they play the whole damn song? Yeah, right. right? right. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, that was a big thing. Like th we did a, a medley, I think, on the systematic chaos tour and we called it schmedley wilcox right, right. that was the name of the medley but i think that was um it was part so, of the lyrics and i fucking hate when rush does medleys yeah right and, the lines. And, and they just said uh i wish they did schmedley medley instead or something like that exactly yeah but, <laughs> but I, I always loved that see i always thought that was a create really cool creative outlet and a way for them to do snippets of like by tour or 2112 yeah. and, and yeah. you know get them in there and, and they they were very creative with it they were it was... they were really creative and and I'm, I'm like half joking but i i remember being like watching the show i'm like play the whole song like, <laughs> i wanted to hear it and then it would get interrupted by another one I'm like damn yeah. it <laughs> but they were well, ahead of time with the, the shrinking uh attention span Right. <laughs> but then you guys ended up doing medleys also later, uh, you know. With, with well, we did, but I'm saying that was always a, a thing. Like John, right. John was always it. like, man, I hate doing medleys. I, hate when <laughs> I fucking hate when Rush does medleys. That was the running joke. <laughs> well, get a t-shirt made. <laughs> <laughs> that was the running joke. Uh, well, guys, this was awesome. We could talk about this kind of stuff forever. Thank you so much for doing it. It's a blast. And, Absolutely. Uh, Thanks yeah. for having us. This was and, fun. And again, Liquid Tension Experiment, LT3, March 26th. Keep your eyes peeled for more videos and things to come out. And um, I mean, everybody's freaking out. There's uh, over half a million views on the first video. And it's just people are really excited about it. So congrats on that. It's great. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk to you guys uh, again soon. Thanks, guys. Right. Good. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>